In this program, we'll be demonstrating some aspects of black and white television, which I'll explain in the book. Um, in particular, we'll be looking at scanning and at various video waveforms. Now, in the real thing, scanning takes place so fast, and there are so many scanning lines that you can't actually perceive the scanning process. Well, that's the whole point of the scanning thing. You can't actually see it happening. So we have had to build up a model so that you can see what's happening more slowly with less lines. On uh, this oscilloscope, um, we are tracing out a very simple raster consisting of eight lines. I'm using a storage scope, so you can actually see the lines after they've been traced out by the spot. You can also see the spot moving. The way this raster is produced is by applying sawtooth waveforms to the X and the Y plates of the oscilloscope. Let's look at these waveforms. The lowest trace of all is the X, that is the line waveform. Then above it, we have the Y waveform. And you can see that there are eight X waveforms for every Y waveform. In other words, the spot moves across the screen eight times each time it moves from top to bottom of the screen. Now, in an actual television, the two time bases are synchronized by means of pulses which are extracted from the signal after demodulation. Also extracted from the signal is a video signal which is used to modify the brightness of the spot so that white patches and dark patches of the picture can be produced by altering the luminance of the spot. I'll try and build up a picture in the form of a stripe uh, going from left to right across the picture by applying a video signal to the oscilloscope. Erase the trace and alter the whiteness. Ah, I'm beginning to get the picture. Well, I wanted a continuous stripe, but I'm not getting that. It's not surprising. There are only eight lines in the picture, so I'm just getting eight spots. So in order to try and improve things, I'm going to now use more lines. I'll use 256 lines. Now we're beginning to get a continuous stripe, which is what I wanted. Well, let's have a look at the video signal which I'm using to produce this continuous stripe. In order to display the signal, I'm scanning the lower oscilloscope at line weight. That's the same X scan as on the uh, other tube. The video signal consists of a pulse. When the level is high, we have a bright spot. When the level is low, the spot is blanked. Notice how, as the spot is traced out, the, the pulse is keeping in step with that spot. Well, that's how a video signal can be built up. Um, of course, um, in a real television system, um, the pictures are very much complicated, more complicated, and also uh, they occur much faster. Our pictures took about 40 seconds to build up, whereas in a natural system, there are 25 pictures per second. Uh, this is necessary in order to be able to show motion and also to avoid flicker. Now, in order to see what real television systems are like, Glyn Martin and I went over to the BBC Training Centre at Wood Norton. This room is part of the special teaching facilities here at Wood Norton. And behind this desk is a console containing apparatus, which enables the lecturer to demonstrate certain pictures and video waveforms to his students. The main components of the console are an oscilloscope, which enables him to look at video waveforms, and Attached to the oscilloscope is a system of mirrors which enables a camera mounted in the console to look at the screen of the oscilloscope. The picture from the camera can be displayed on the lecturer's monitor or on the monitors in the room. To the right of the monitor is a panel which enables the lecturer to select the different pictures and the different waveforms. We'll be using this throughout this program, but to begin with, I want to demonstrate the field scanning waveforms of an actual television set. This is the one we should be using. It's actually a studio monitor, but in common with your set at home, it uses magnetic deflection. The field produced by the magnetic coils is proportional to the current flowing in them, so I've connected a current probe inside to measure this current, and we can look at it on the oscilloscope screen. Just over two periods of the scanning waveform is shown, and the point to notice is that it is nonlinear. The reason why is explained in detail in the book, 
but the basis of the argument is that because the screen is almost flat instead of spherical, then a changing current in the scanning waveform at the edge of the picture will produce a larger deflection than if the beam were at the center of the picture. I can also show the effect of changing the amplitude of this scanning waveform by altering the height control on this monitor. And I'll do that now. First of all, I'll decrease the amplitude of the scanning waveform. And now, increase it again. We've been looking at the field scan waveform at the deflection coils. And these have to be accurately timed. And this is done by triggering the scan waveform generator. We can look at this trigger pulse on the oscilloscope. The flyback of the scan waveform is initiated by this trigger pulse. And accurate timing is ensured because this trigger pulse is derived from the synchronizing pulses sent as part of the composite video signal. And we can look at these synchronizing pulses on the lower trace on the oscilloscope. The picture is somewhat confused now, so we can remove the top trace and expand the this time base to get a clearer idea of what's happening. The upper trace is the trigger pulse to the field scan waveform, and underneath it are five broad pulses, called the five field board pulses, which produce this trigger pulse. On either side of these five broad pulses are equalizing pulses, and the reason for these equalizing pulses is explained in the book. They ensure accurate timing. Now also present in the synchronizing pulse waveform are pulses which um, trigger the line scan generator. And we can look at these as well on the oscilloscope screen. These are the line synchronizing pulses. The receiver can separate these from the entire synchronizing pulse train because they are of shorter duration than the field broad pulses I mentioned earlier. Each one of these pulses initiates a line scan waveform, and we can see this waveform underneath. The rising edge of the, the scan pulse initiates the flyback action on the scan waveform. And in this way, accurate timing is again maintained. Well, the waveforms that we've been looking at are associated with the scanning process in the receiver. Gabby is now going to show you some of the waveforms which are, contain the picture information. First, I'd like to look at the waveform corresponding to the picture which Glean was using a moment ago. The picture is the picture of a grill. What I'll do is to display the waveform above the grill. Here it is. I've displayed the waveform for a couple of lines. Here's the sync pulse for the first line, and here's the second sync pulse. This level is the black level here, and the white level is positive up here. I'm using the same convention as I used in the book, with sync negative and white positive. Well now, let's see how the waveform ties up with the picture itself. In order to do this, I'll expand the sweep. I've expanded the sweep to show the part of the line which appears on the picture. If I bring up the grill, I think you can see that each pulse um, corresponds to a vertical white part of the picture. Each white pulse, so here we have a white pulse and here another white pulse. So that's how the picture's built up and uh, I hope you can see that that does produce the, the vertical lines. Now let's look at another picture, which this time I'll show you the waveform and try and guess what the picture ought to look like. So here is the waveform. It's essentially a sine wave and its frequency is getting faster and faster towards the right. It's increasing in frequency with time. Now what does the picture look like? Well, here's a picture. I hope you got it right, a set of light and dark bars, and of course the bars getting closer and closer towards the right, um, up to the point where probably you can't distinguish them on the right because the frequency is too high and the screen won't resolve. Well, let's see how this ties up, the waveform with the picture. The peaks 
of the waveform correspond to the white parts and the troughs correspond to the black parts. Now I can display these pictures quite easily with a setup we have here um, at the Wood Norton BBC Training Centre. In fact, the setup provides us some quite interesting examples of the handling of composite video waveforms. So Glyn will now describe a couple of these examples. The way in which we produce a horizontal split screen, that is one picture above the other, is really quite simple. What is done is to switch between the two picture sources at the correct time during each field scan. For instance, if the screen is to be equally divided between the pictures, picture one is switched in during the first half of each field and picture two during the last half of each field. This would mean that the top half of the picture one would be shown above the lower half of picture two. In most practical horizontal split screen systems, it's desirable to be able to adjust the position at which the split between the pictures occurs. The way in which this switch is controlled in such a system is like this. The sync separator circuit produces a pulse at the start of each field. And this pulse is then delayed by a variable delay circuit. When the delay has elapsed, the second picture source is switched in and it fills the remainder of the screen. In practice, we wait for the next line sync pulse after the end of the delay to switch in the picture, as this makes sure that the picture change takes place off the screen. Well, let's try this facility. The two signals we'll be using will be the grill and the diagram of the system. Here they are, first the grill and second the diagram. At the moment, I'm using zero delay, so the second picture is switched in right at the beginning of each field and we have the complete diagram. Now I'll increase the delay and the grill starts to appear at the top of the screen. Increasing the delay means that we stay with the grill for longer before switching to the diagram. And when the delay is a whole field period, we have the complete grill. The second demonstration facility we've used is the display of the waveform of an individual line. In order for the oscilloscope to display the correct line, we have to make sure that the scope is triggered at the correct instant. So let's see how that's done. Suppose we want to display the waveform of line 245 on the scope. Then a pulse is needed to trigger the scope after 245 lines of each picture. An electronic counter is used to count the line sync pulses, and the number of the required line is stored as a binary number in the electronic store. When the count in the counter reaches the value in the store, a logic circuit produces the required trigger pulse. Now a trigger pulse has to be produced for each complete picture, and that is equivalent to each alternate field. So the counter has two inputs, one for the line sync pulses, and one for the pulses at the start of alternate fields, which reset the counter to zero. In this way, a trigger pulse is produced each time line 245 is traced on the picture screen. So, OK, let's use this facility. The picture source is the variable frequency sine wave that we saw earlier. And we'll look at line 245 on the picture. That's highlighted by the horizontal white line. We can look at the waveform of this line by using the horizontal split screen facility. And now we can compare the pictorial representation of this line with its associated waveform. Besides demonstrating some aspects of the Wood Norton setup, um, the idea of that demonstration was to show you the kind of signal processing uh, that takes place in television systems. Now, no transmission system is perfect. Uh, all systems introduce some form of distortion. We may be able to specify the distortion electrically, but um, what does it do to the picture? Well, one of the demonstrations we did at Wood Norton was aimed at answering just this question. I want to show you the result of introducing certain defects into the transmission path of a video signal. I have some boxes here which enable me to introduce various defects which I can select. The setup is like this. There is a transmission path between the picture source and the display, and I can introduce a defect by plugging in the defect box, switching it in, or I can look at the signal directly. The display consists at the bottom of the picture, which results from whatever waveform I'm feeding in, and there'll be a couple of waveforms. The top waveform is the waveform before 
the defect has been introduced, and the waveform underneath will show the effect of introducing the defect. Well, the first waveform I'd like to look at is one in which we have reduced the high frequencies. It's a waveform you've met before, a sinusoid of gradually increasing frequency. If I introduce the defect, namely a filter which cuts off the high frequencies, you should be able to see the result on the lower waveform. If you look at this region, the amplitude has been drastically cut down. We've lost the high frequency. I'll remove the defect and restore the picture. The picture, of course, consists of bars, and because the high frequency is on the right, the bars are getting closer and closer and finer and finer. So when I introduce my filter, I remove these bars on the right, but because of the limited response of your set, you may not be able to see this effect, so we'll expand the picture. When I connect the filter, you should be able to see the bars disappearing. I'll connect it. Now I'll disconnect it. They should appear again. Connect it and disconnect it. We've looked at high frequency effects, now low frequency effects. I can switch in a filter which removes low frequencies. The waveform I'm going to use is a square waveform. And since I'm interested in low frequencies, I'm going to concentrate on the horizontal parts of the waveforms because that's when things are changing slowly. This is the output waveform, and I'm going to switch in the filter. What we get is a droop of the uh, positive bit, and the negative bit is rising up. I'll switch the filter out and in again. Well, this effect is something which is discussed in Unit 1, and if you don't remember it, you can look up Unit 1 again after the program. The picture, which consists of black and white bands, is affected by this, and if I switch it in and out, you should see a kind of change of contrast. What's happening is that this region, corresponding to the black region, is quite black, and it's getting less black as you move across. And the converse effect is happening in the white region, and this result, this change of contrast, of merging of one color, one shade into the other, is known as streaking, and it's an effect which occurs in wide areas of white and black in the picture when the low frequencies are removed. So much for the frequency response of the transmission channel. Now I want to look at the effect of introducing nonlinearities into the transmission channel kind of nonlinearities that arise when one has amplifiers which are nonlinear. We use such amplifiers uh, for gamma correction. They introduce nonlinearity, but that's only to compensate for the inherent nonlinearity of the picture tube, so as to produce overall linearity in the system. Now, a useful waveform for looking at linearity and nonlinearity is a staircase waveform, which I have displayed. Now, the picture this produces is a set of uh, grey patches, black on the left and white on the right. But what I want you to concentrate on first is this side of the output waveform as I introduce nonlinearity. At present, the input and the output look the same. In other words, we've got a linear situation. I'm now going to introduce nonlinearity, and the net result, in this case, the kind of nonlinearity I am introducing, is to compress the signal so the gain is less at high levels and low levels. So you can see that the stair are practically curving downwards compared with the straight steps of the input. Well, what does this do to the signal? Well, if to the picture, that is, if you concentrate on the right-hand side of the picture, you should be able to see the effect. I shall, first of all, return to the linear condition and then go nonlinear, compress, then return, compress, and you should be able to see that the patches of grey are merging towards each other and we are losing contrast. So that is the effect of introducing a nonlinearity into the transmission channel. Now for the kind of thing that happens when the signal propagates along two paths of different lengths. A typical situation is the one where you have a direct path between transmitter and receiver and a second longer path which involves a signal bouncing off a nearby hill. 
Now, we can't show this thing directly because we happen to be on top of a hill. But we can simulate it with this setup. We have a picture source and a direct link to a display. Now, into this link, I can tee a long cable. Where it's relatively long, a signal takes five microseconds to travel from one end to the other. When it gets to the far end, there's an open circuit, so the signal is reflected. It comes back to where it started with a 10 microsecond delay. So we can introduce a second signal with a 10 microsecond delay. The picture I've chosen to display is a test card. It's a convenient signal to show the effect. And what I will do is to connect the cable in to the path. And now I'll take it out again. And I'll connect it in again. And I hope you can see what's happening. The effect of reflection is what's known as ghosts. We get pictures reproduced but displaced, and fainter, of course, because the signal's attenuated on the secondary path, the path which is delayed by 10 microseconds. If you look at the circle at the center, as I connect the cable in, you should see a ghost picture of it, for instance. Well, that is the result of introducing an extra path, and I've used a test card to show that effect. Before, I used all sorts of convenient test signals, each signal selected to show up the effect I was interested in. But it'd be rather inconvenient to have to use different test signals each time one wanted to test for different defects. The test card is indeed very convenient to show all these effects and many others besides. And Glyn will show you how a test card can be used for some defects. The most frequently used test signal is the familiar test card picture. And different areas of this picture are used to test for different system defects. For instance, this region to the right of the circle is used to check the high frequency response. It contains several rectangles with vertical lines. In the rectangle at the bottom, the lines are closely spaced, and at the top, they're more widely spaced. So the lines at the bottom correspond to higher frequency components than the lines at the top. Any loss in high frequency components will mean the lines in the bottom rectangles will not be visible. Another part of the test card is used to check for the low frequency response of the system. It's this area above the circle. It's called the letterbox. Inadequate low frequency response in a system will cause streaking of the black area into the white. The area to the left of the circle is used to check for nonlinear effects on the video signal. This area consists of a gray scale made up of rectangles, and any nonlinearity shows up as a loss of contrast between these rectangles. The test card can be used to set the picture size on the screen using the reference markers at the top and bottom and on either side. Once the picture size is set up, scan linearity can be checked for because any departure from linear scanning will cause the rectangles to be distorted. Reflections in the signal will cause a ghosting of the picture and uniformity of focusing of the picture can be checked over the entire screen. Now that I've explained how the test card can be used to test for system defects, you may like to use it to test your own television receiver.